Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Let's let him know how grateful we are. Hallelujah. For being our God. Hallelujah. To Jesus for being our Savior. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Whew, I have so much on my mind, so much to cover. So, so that I don't forget, I want to honor and, and welcome and, and, and thank. Now, you know what? I, I forgot your name already, I, but, but what was that? Grady. Grady Stevens in? All right. I was about to call you Johnny Stevens' husband. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you for the assist, dear. Hallelujah. I also want to acknowledge the praise team. Amen. Wasn't that a beautiful time of praise? Hallelujah. We lifted up the Lord the way he deserves to be lifted up and, and, and sung to. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to thank uh, Brother Jason. I don't see him in here, but I want to thank him for making a, a special trip over to get our brother Frank. Amen. Yeah. Sister Linda usually brings him and she wasn't going to make it. And so Brother Jason made a special trip. Amen. The fields drove separately yeah. so that our brother could be in the house yeah. of the Lord. How about that? How about that? How about that? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Because Brother Frank may miss sometimes, but he never wants to miss. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Welcome to those of you who are joining online. We thank God for you. You could have done anything this morning. We uh, thank the Lord for pressing uh, on your heart uh, to be with us virtually. Amen. Amen. And we also continue to pray for all of those who are on the prayer list. So please know while the prayer list is called out before we go online, know that all of those that you submitted to us that we should stand in the gap for, we are doing that on a daily basis. Hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Boy, I tell you, I, I've had, I don't usually say when I'm going to be out of town, I was out of town this last week. I don't, I try not to announce it. But those who did know I was out of town, I'm, I'm grateful uh, for your prayers. Amen. I was able to have uh, what is so? I went to Atlanta uh, last week, or was it last? It was this past week, amen, and uh, for business. And um, it was four hours there and four and a half hours back. And I just want to tell you, God blessed me not only, only to get there, but to have peace and joy the whole flight. Yeah. The whole flight. Usually, like to be on the aisle. I was next to the window both times, and I had a good old time, amen. amen. Hallelujah. I had peace. I don't think I opened my, I slept most of the way, but even when I wasn't sleeping, I had my eyes closed on the way there. I was in just a state, just a place. God is consecrating me. He's not just consecrating me. If I, if I know something that I shouldn't do and I kind of half think about doing it, he sets me straight. That's where I am right now. That's what it takes right now for me to be what I need to be for him. And boy, let me just tell you, when I get right, when I get straight, oh my God, it's beautiful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was on my way back. I'll quickly get past this so I don't hold you guys too long because I do have a word. But I'm on my way back and I'm tired because it was an exhausting trip. And I'm on my way back and I'm thinking I'm going to sleep the whole way. But I didn't. I had downloaded some movies and I, and I watched a, a movie uh, uh, that I'd started uh, on the way back. And then I said, OK, I'll, I'll watch one more and that'll get me all the way home. And I couldn't watch that movie. I couldn't watch it because it didn't sit right with my spirit. I had no idea it was going to be all the stuff that was there. And I said, you know what? I, I, I'm not worried about being bored. I'm going to shut this thing off. I'm going to shut this thing off. But I didn't take my headphones off. Amen. I didn't take my Bose headphones off. Hallelujah. I, I kept that noise reduction on maximum so I couldn't hear anything that was going on. And let me just tell you, I had a con I had church on the plane. I had church on the plane. All they could see was me. Doing this and doing this and then wiping my eyes because I'm crying. They just, nobody asked me what was going on, but I bet somebody around would say, Woo, I want what he's got. I had some church on the plane. And as we went through, I looked out of the window because I'm usually on the aisle. I looked out of the window and I marveled at what my God made. 
I marveled over the Midwest, looking at how flat it was. And I marveled when we got close to home, looking at the mountain's majesty that our God created. Oh, it was beautiful. And I got a nice shot on my phone of his mountains in the foreground and his sun setting in the background. Oh, I had a time. Oh, I had a time. Lord, have mercy. And yes, oh, yes, yes, yesterday I got up and I thank God for waking me up and I thank God for you all and I thank God for my family. I thank God for everything that I could think of at the time. And I started playing a song. Boy, I can't remember the name of the song. Brother Marcellus had it teed up. I wish I could play it for you, but we don't have the rights to it. Ah, but I'll just tell you, it blessed my soul. And I just laid there. I put the phone on my chest and I just cried. I just cried. I didn't know my wife was in the other room. She could hear me crying. <laughs> I had no idea. But I just want to let you know that God is moving on in my life. Amen. And I trust that he's moving in your life. Is everything perfect? You better believe not. And when you get it right, you have even more enemy and you, you get it right. I'm telling you, there's there's a challenge at every turn, but there's also Jesus at every turn. There's trouble at every turn. Amen. Amen. But there's still the God in me at every turn. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm confident that he's working the same thing in you in his own way, in his own time. Because we need that, like Pastor Trina said, especially at these times. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Amen. Give the Lord a hand praise. And by the way, we have to really do it. When I say give the Lord a hand praise, we can't give him a golf clap now. Give him a hand, pray. Give him a hand, pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. I want to pray just for a moment, if you all can close your eyes with me. Lord God, I thank you for this opportunity to be before your people in person and online. And Lord God, I just ask that there be more of you and less of me, Lord God. Lord, I, I pray that you would use these lips, you would use this vessel, Lord God, to reach your people, to teach your people, to touch your people, Lord God. And I ask, Lord God, if any of my imperfections get in the way that you would snatch the words in midair, Lord God, and translate it to their hearts, Lord God. Touch their minds, Lord God, and I come against the enemy for anything that he might do to try to get in the way of the purposes of God through this word today. Yeah. I thank you, Lord, in advance for giving me the strength, the stamina and the stamina and the ability. I thank you in advance, Lord God, for touching your people, their ears, their hearts and their minds, Lord God, so that they can hear what thus saith you through this earthen vessel. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus holy name. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Somebody. Amen. Amen. Well, there, it wasn't that long ago, we can call it a generation, maybe some would say two generations ago, when the people in the church would say, you couldn't do anything and still be saved. You couldn't dress a certain way. You couldn't wear makeup. You couldn't go to the movies because Jesus might come back and find you in the movies and you would be what? Left behind. You couldn't do anything. You were, it, we had you afraid of your shadow. Oh my God, you were saved one minute and you were going to hell the next. Amen? And they had you afraid of hell. Amen? They at least told you about it. Fast forward to today and we have I'm going to say, unfortunately, just the opposite. We have just the opposite where you could do just about anything. And oh, you still say grace takes care of it all. It don't take all that. Amen. No, I, it don't. I agree. It doesn't take all. You can't go to the movies. You can't wear this. You can't do that. They meant well. But when you go the opposite direction and you start to cheapen salvation, you are not doing people a favor. That's right. That's right. That's right. But it was meant to be that way at this time because it's the easiest road to the Antichrist system. But we've come all the way to the other extreme. So that it, 
No, it don't take all that, but they make it seem like it doesn't matter at all what you do. You're going to be saved anyhow. And all you have to do is say a few words on one occasion and then you can become a hellion the rest of your life. And that little prayer is supposed to get you into heaven. And I'm here to just tell you the truth. I had to pray before I said this because I know folks don't want. I hope these in front of me want to hear the truth. And maybe maybe you don't need it. Maybe there's somebody that needs to hear it from you. But it's popular. It's easier to just say what make me feel good. There have been people that I've preached to that will walk away saying, I didn't come here. I didn't give my money. I don't spend my time to be beat up. I don't come, you know, to have my feet stepped on. I'm supposed to leave there feeling better than I can. But what if God actually loves you? And he wants you to be better than you'd be by yourself. What if he actually cares? And he's not going to let some jacked up doctrine rule your life. He's going to make sure you hear the truth. How about that? How about if he actually loves you? How about that's what love looks like? Do you give your kids candy for dinner every day? Do you let them eat donuts as much as they want to? No, you don't. Because you love them. Do you let them play in the street? When they shouldn't. Do you let them walk across the street without holding your hand when they're little? No. Why? Because you love them. When they do wrong, do you correct them? Yes. Why? Because you love them. But the premise behind much of the doctrine they utilize as a weapon, they weaponize the well-meaning strictness of the past to make you think that we're supposed to be so liberal that everybody's going to heaven. My job today is to just tell you the truth, amen? amen. Hallelujah, I don't get to pick it. I'd like to be popular like anybody else, but I was built to be a truth teller. I was called to be a truth teller. And I'm called to talk to and teach and lift up and build up truth telling leaders, not followers. We're all following Christ. I may be up here, but I'm talking to leaders. I'm talking to leaders. You got to give leaders meat. Hallelujah. There's a time for milk, but there's time for meat. And in this day and time, we need meat. Amen. So my main thrust, my main message this morning to you all is that you value, somebody say value. Value. value salvation. Sounds too simple, doesn't it? Value salvation. It's been cheap and I'm asking you to value salvation. And, and please help me, Lord, here. Please help me. If I had a secondary topic, now hear me now, it's not my primary topic. What's my primary topic? Value. Value salvation. If I had a secondary topic, it might go something like this. Once saved, always saved, question mark. Or if you're going to argue me on that, well, were they ever really saved? That's passion. That's not judgment. That's passion. I'm asking you this morning, I'm impressing upon you this morning that it is important that you value salvation. I know that it didn't take all of that. Hallelujah. But let me tell you, it takes something. You're going to go to heaven and spend forever with God, but you can't care about him now. It, it, you're gonna, you're gonna, ain't no switch flicking. You're not going to flip a switch. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. This is love. I'm giving you the opportunity. God's giving you the opportunity to see him for real, Amen. to embrace him for real. And then once to know him, to really know him is to love him. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Is to appreciate him, is to honor him, is to respect him as a, the best father you could ask for. 
So I'm telling you, we should value salvation. Do I have an agreement in the house? But we're not going to value salvation if we do not value Jesus. I'm going to say it again. We will not value salvation if we do not value Jesus enough. And we will not value Jesus enough, hear me now, if we do not recognize the real problem that he came here and died for. If you do not recognize the real problem as sin, then you will be judging him and the father for every problem you have that he chooses not to solve. You'll be judging God. You'll be blaming God. A few months ago we preached about why do good things, bad things happen to good people. There are people who are messed up in their mind. They are boggled in their mind over this particular question because they don't recognize whatever that person went through. There's heaven forever. Did nothing. Oh, come on. And if they left before you and they had Jesus, they're better off than you. But if they left before you and we didn't tell them the truth, there is a hell waiting for them. That's what you should be upset about. You should be upset at the preacher for telling them the feel good message when they needed to hear that they needed to change. You should have been upset that the the church accepted met the metal mind, which is repentance to avoid the penalty, the punishment. The outcome and not expecting metanoia, a true change. That's what you ought to be upset about. But no, we want to judge God. We want to judge him for not healing us fast enough. We want to judge him for not giving us enough money. We want to judge him for giving somebody else a heathen what seems to be a good husband and we still single. We want to judge him. Because he doesn't solve our little earthly problems and then we miss the main problem. We miss the main problem. He came down here not to give me a house, not to give me, you know, a big bank account. He came down here to give me a bank account in heaven. He came down here to make it possible. Listen to me. I can't earn my way. But he made it possible that if I lived a life according to his word and I loved him, I can get in. Because without that, my righteousness is but filthy rags. I can be almost perfect and it won't be enough. That's why he died. Not to give me some carte blanche. I can do anything. I don't have to respect God. He's a little G God. I can get in anyway because I said a prayer 10 years ago. I meant it at the moment, but do I mean it now? Do I mean it now? I'm talking about valuing salvation. Valuing as a verb, it's also a noun, but to consider someone or something to be important, to be beneficial, and to have a high regard and opinion of it. Amen or for it? So when you value someone or something, its importance to you shows up in your actions. And not just for a moment. Not just for a quick little prayer, but for a while, amen, over time. Hallelujah. So the question on the table is, do we really value salvation? I'm trying to say as much as I possibly can that we should, amen. Amen. Do we really value the relationship that we get to have with God? And do we value the price that was paid? so that we can have it. Do we value what Jesus did, what he pressed through, just so he could hang with you? 
And just so that you don't have to go to the place with the other feller. And the people who choose to follow the other feller. But the other feller knows our real problem is sin, which is why he plants his seeds to get us to think that it's something else. It hasn't changed. Go to Genesis 3. It hasn't changed. His main weapon is to make you feel that he thinks you more important than God. To make you feel like God's holding back on you. To change your opinion of your father. Listen to me, because it happens in regular life too. To sully your opinion, your regard, your respect for your father who told you not to touch it because he loved you. But now we want to make him a meanie. We want to make him a mean God, a mad God, an angry God. Excuse me. You know when your child does something that you know would have detrimental effects to them long term. You get upset, your adrenaline flows, and then you calm down later. <laughs> but you don't want them to be harmed. Satan doesn't care about you being harmed. So he's going to give you a gospel of convenience. He's going to give you a gospel of feel good. That's what I want to hear. But he doesn't mean you well. My job is to help you see that. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Chapter two. Because the writer of Hebrews, we think is Paul. We're not totally sure. Was dealing with this very question. Hebrews is a beautiful book because it builds up to a crescendo. We focus most on Hebrews 11, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. And a few verses later, it says, you know, to come to God, you must believe that he is. He must first exist to you and that he is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. And then we go through the rolls of the Rolodex of the Hall of Faith. And that brings us to Hebrews chapter 2. And I'm just going to quickly address, ah, I'm looking at the time, uh, verses 1 through 3. Because I just want you to know that we're going we're to use a text in Hebrew. It won't be in this particular chapter. We're just setting the stage. I want you to know that the writer of Hebrews was addressing this same question. Do we value, and you should value, salvation? And once saved... Always saved, question mark. But maybe, just maybe, if you're going to argue with me there, maybe they were just never, never really saved. Why? Why am I saying this? Because some are not going to make it. If, if that's true, then the only people going to hell are the ones who just never consider God ever at all. And yet he said that there would be those in the church that said, I did all this in your name. I did all that in your name. I, 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 I healed folks in your name. And he's going to say, I never knew you. It's not a biblical teaching to make you cheapen salvation that Jesus died for. That's passion. That's not anger. Let's go to chapter two, where the writer says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to uh, largely a Hebrew or Jewish audience at the time. But he's talking to those who have converted, those who consider themselves Christians as part of the church, as part of the body of Christ. Therefore, we ought to give a more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest, read the rest of it for me. At any time, we, should let them speak. Mm, at any time we uh, so, so, so I want you to, to earnestly heed the things you've heard, because if you're not earnestly heeding them, if you're just sitting back, relax, folding your hands and saying, oh, you know, grace covers it all. I ain't got to do nothing. Don't matter how I treat God. Doesn't matter how I treat people. Doesn't matter how much I sin. It's all done. It's already finished. It's finished. 
That's why you have an opportunity. Otherwise, you were lost forever. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, right? Does this sound like Christians? This sounds like we're talking to the church. This is not an evangelical message and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So we are second generation Christians, if you will, if you think of it as the apostles, the original disciples got it straight from Jesus. And then now you've gotten it from them. So let's just take earnest heed to what we heard and not take it lightly. Are you with me so far? Now let's fast forward to chapter 12. It was building and building and building and building and we get to chapter 11 and it was a faith chapter. and We had all of the, all of the patriarchs and all of those who manifested the evidence of what it means to have faith because it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, but you want the substance to be a house. You want the substance to be a bank account. You want the substance to be a job. You want the substance to be healing. And he was trying to get them to understand that these Patriarchs, these these heroes of faith, what the thing that they were looking for is the thing you get to take for granted. All right, all right. They died Amen. looking toward this thing. Amen. And now you have it and you can't take it for granted. And now you get to be close to God. They didn't have they didn't get to be that close to God. How dare you? Now go when that veil is written and you go in there disrespecting him. How dare you? It was, that veil wasn't written for that reason. For you to take him lightly. For you to let him be a little G God. For you to make him your, your porter. For you to make him your waiter. For you to make him your vending machine. That's not why that veil was written. You better come correct. He is worthy of all of that. Lord, Passion. Not anger. So we're in Hebrews 12. And the writer says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, since we have all of these witnesses. Let us do what? Lay aside, Lay aside throw it down. Every weight. And every sin, which what? Does so easily beset us. I'm going to stop there. I'm try I have so much to get through. Help me, Jesus. This doesn't mean fold it nicely because you're coming back for it. Lay aside. Be done with it. Be done with it. This is where I am at least, I'll just speak for me, right now with God, I don't have a whole lot, but the what I have, it needs to be done. I get no wiggle room. Yes, yes, yes. Amen, amen. If I walk near it, I feel it. Amen. Lay aside every sin and every weight that's gonna get in your way, and let's read the rest of it, and let us instead run with patience. Now that sin and weight might be a substance. That sin and weight might be things you covet that you shouldn't have want. It, that thing might be somebody Amen. that you need to lay aside. And I don't mean try to leave the door open for later. Right. <laughs> and let us run. Did he say walk? Run, run with patience, which means endurance. This race that is set before us run with endurance, not asking for everything to be so perfect and so easy endurance. That means staying under whatever burden that is required for your race. It doesn't mean running and, and stopping to, to protest every time because you don't think it's fair. It doesn't mean not running your race because God is not coming through for you fast enough. Whatever it is that he chose for you to be challenged with, you accept that and run in your lane. 
You don't compare to the other lane. You don't compare to that lane because he knew you before you were even formed in the womb. And he knows we're all sinners and he knows your special sins. He knows exactly what you need to not be given. Somebody else can have it. Oh, but we'll judge him. Oh, they got it. How come we didn't get it? Huh? Even pastors will do it. How come I'm doing everything right? How come I'm preaching to five people and they have a whole cathedral? Don't you dare envy them. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Running your race with endurance, remaining under whatever challenge God chooses to give you to deal with and finishing your race. Hallelujah. Dealing with those challenges. Let me tell you what he's about to do. I'm doing my best to get you there. And I'm mindful of the clock, but I'm going to finish my race, even if you have to go to lunch before I finish. We run this race knowing that we have resistance and challenges. But hear me, and you should know, people of God, that some of that resistance and some of those challenges, God intentionally allows. So while, you get ready, while we get ready to judge him, whomever we are, oh yeah, he allows some of that stuff. Yes. Hmm. Yes, he does. Now you want to judge him, you just go right ahead. I'm telling you to value your salvation, but if you want to go about judging God, we're going to get you straight here for a minute. Amen. He allows some of those challenges. He allows some of those difficulties for your own good, for my own good. But here's the thing. Now, the, the writer goes all through all of this 11 chapters. Now he's in the 12th. He's about to say it. He's about to end this thing. And he says, lay aside every sin and wait that does so easily beset you. And I can talk about fornication. I can talk about money. I can talk about covetousness. I can talk about houses, cars, and all this sort of stuff. But look at what he chooses as his key point. What he chooses to focus on, the sin and weight that can knock you off your game, that can make you bring up the question, once saved, always saved, maybe they were never saved, is the issue of the fact that your God allows things to happen to you and you can become resentful. If you fail to recognize the value of God's loving correction. Amen. We don't even have to put loving in there. It should be implied. God's correction. Oh, but for yes. now, folks, nowadays, we're so sensitive, we're so ready. Our gun is cocked to judge God and his people, his messengers. We soften it. God's loving correction before you jump out at me. So we can become resentful if we fail to recognize the value of God's correction and his chosen ways of doing so. All right. All right. If we don't recognize it, you will ruin your relationship in the process. You will ruin your very life and it could be your eternal life. Right. Let's go to verse 11. Boy, there's so much here I wish we could read through. I, I, before we go to 11, I, I just feel obligated to at least tell you that in verse 6 it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he what? Chasteneth. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And I know it seems rough at the end of the verse where it says, And he scourgeth every son who, who receives him. If, if, you just, if, you, if that's a stumbling block, I just invite you. I don't want to be heretical. You can look past that. Just understand. He's not trying to beat you out of hatred. Because we got the new age stuff now in church, in parenting. I, I, you know, it, we, we get stumbling blocks when we read the word or hear it preached sometimes. 
Verse 7 says, if you endure chastening, correction, then God deals with you as, as sons. Amen? Amen? For what son is it that a father doesn't correct or chasten it? But if you are without, without chastening, if, if somebody's not telling you what's right, if somebody's not correcting your path, if somebody's not pulling your hand back from the fire, if somebody's not leaping at you to save you from something, instead of just saying you're so beautiful, you're so wonderful, then you are illegitimate. Because you don't go around giving your life, putting your life in jeopardy, you don't go around trying to correct everybody's children. You focus on correcting your own, amen? amen. Trying to get somewhere. Let's go to 11. In the interest of time, Lord have mercy. Oh, to transition to 11, I just have to say for, for verily for, it, it's just a few days, we, 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 our earthly fathers, you know, they, they chasten us, but God and our earthly fathers, if they're good fathers, for credit, for profit, and as it relates to God, so that we can partake of his holiness. Do you want to partake of his holiness? Amen. Verse 11, he says, now no chasing, no correction at the present time seems joyous. Anybody like being corrected? Anybody like being set straight? Anybody like being told that they're wrong? You can't have something because it will ruin you. It's not good for your teeth. It's not good for your health. It's not good for your salvation. Do you want to No, we don't want to No, I'm not saying it ought to be fun if God corrects us. I'm telling you that it's for your own good. Amen. So no chasing or correction, correcting it for the present time seems joyous, but it's grievous. We understand that because it's dealing with the flesh, but the spirit man should embrace it. Amen. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Amen. And God's right or die want this peaceable fruit of righteousness. Amen. Unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore now, I've told you all of this. Now, wherefore, I'm going to have to reinterpret this for you, but wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Because you've gotten so offended at how God deals with you and corrects you, you feel beaten down by God, so you are revengeful, uh, 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 resentful, so you're not moving forward. You're not running your race. You've got feeble knees and arms hanging down. So he says, wherefore, lift up those hands which hang down and the feeble knees and get to running. Lift up those knees and run toward that finish line. And he says, and make straight the paths of your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. That sounds kind of hard to interpret. Stop feeling sorry for yourself and being resentful to God for giving you the right thing, even though it doesn't feel good. And you lift up those arms and you lift up those knees and you run that race. Because it's already going to be tough enough with the challenges he gives you. Don't add to it, allowing you already feeble need. You already ailing. You already have to deal with all the challenges that he lets the world and Satan throw you away for, his, for your own good. Amen? Amen. But if you feeble need, if you don't, you're going to make it harder on yourself. You should, have a, you, you should want to have a straight and smooth, even road that doesn't go like this. Because if you feeble need, you know what happens? If you don't do what you can do to make the road smooth and the road uh, 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 straight, you're going to fall. And when you fall, that's not a good place to be. That's not a good place to be when you didn't have to fall. I hope you got it. I, I, if you didn't, it, we'll just say it's on me. Amen? Amen. Don't make it worse. I know that's a, I'm, just, I'm trying to tell you what he was trying to tell them. He says, you, you, you know, you, your feeble need and your arms are hanging out because of the challenges of life. And, and because you're resentful, you, you won't therefore then do the thing that you could do and should do to make it easier on yourself. Because when you get resentful, you say, oh, forget it. I'll move on in the interest of time. But he said, you know, if you straighten up and see God for what he really is and you won't make it harder on yourself. And then you can be healed. 
because with time you can be healed, but if you're going to make it harder on yourself, all you're going to do is trip and fall, and now we've got another problem. Who are you going to blame that on? Amen. 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 Verse 14, follow peace with all men, and what? Holiness. Holiness. Keep reading. Without which? No oh, okay, all right, so, so it's required to have holiness in order to see the Lord. Does that mean don't go into the movies? Does that mean don't wearing your dress up to a certain place? Does that mean you can't, you know, wear makeup? What does that mean all that? No. No, it don't take all that, but is holiness required? Do you think holiness is saying a prayer for 30 seconds and then being a hellion for the rest of your life? It matters how you relate to God. One save, always save, question mark. I don't know, maybe, maybe they would never say. Looking what? Diligently. I want you to notice what the Bible says, not what man and all this crazy doctrine. It, you, you're supposed to care enough to try to do right. You're supposed to care enough to try to be right. You're supposed to care enough. And if you really say, if you really know him, I bet you do. I bet you do. Looking diligently, we got some less coming up here. We already saw the less before because you might basically turn away and basically saying you fall instead of being healed. Looking diligently, lest any man, what does it say? Fail of the grace of God, meaning fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you. That is resentment. And thereby many be defiled. That means that thing, that bitter Spirit, that I'm mad with God. Spirit, that that's not fair. I deserve better. Spirit, that I want to run my life. I'm going to tell God how to do it. Spirit, it's infectious. It's worse than COVID. More infectious than COVID, and it's more deadly than COVID. Now, I'm going to hang just for a second for your benefit for later. Notice that he says, it will trouble you, and thereby many be what? defiled, stained, polluted, corrupted, stained, polluted, corrupted. You don't like the way God does things, so you get bitter because he's trying to tell you about yourself. I know something about that, being resented for saying the right thing. And this attitude, this approach to God that the Bible says, lest ye fail, come short of what? The grace of God. And that becomes infectious. And people, many people, become stained. We're talking about the garment now. Become stained, become polluted. Verse 16, lest there be any what? Fornicator or profane person. A profane person is somebody that's unholy, that is not authorized to enter into the presence of God. They're unfit for access. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. We're talking about Someone who, because of their bitterness, because of their resentment for God, they say all forget, they end up being this fornicator, that, which is also idolater and profane person. They, they, they turn their back on God. You can become so embittered by your circumstances that you start judging God by your circumstances. He came to fix your eternal circumstance. Yes. Yes. You miss it. Yes. We can miss it. And he likens, he uses as an example, listen to this, as Esau. Now, he's just talking some heavy stuff. He's talking about bitterness and trouble and being defiled, which is stained, which is corrupted, which is polluted, lest there be any fornicator or, or, or profane person as Esau. Who did what? He sold his birth, right, for some soup, <laughs> a morsel of 
meat. And ye know how that afterward, when he was to inherit the blessing, because he says, you know what? I don't care that much about the birthright. I'm hungry. But you know what? All right, I gave up the birthright, but I still got the blessing. Nah, 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 nah. I'm still going to get the blessing. I'm still going to have, have Father Isaac say all these great things, so my life is going to be wonderful. That's fine. You got the birthright, but I still have the blessing coming. He took the meaning. He took the specialness of the birthright lightly, sold it cheaply, and he figured, that's okay. I have the blessing coming. All right, now, come on now. And then it says, for you know how that afterward, when he would have, when he thought he should have inherited the blessing, he was what? Rejected. Rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it with tears. In other words, once that word was spoken, you couldn't take it back. Once he went down that road and took it lightly with his birthright, he thought he could just dilly dally and he can come back at the end and just kind of recover at the end. And no, he set a thing in motion because he really didn't care about the thing that was important. He really didn't care about this thing that connected him to a special relationship with his father on behalf of the family. He really didn't care. He thought he could just do half stepping. He thought he could do half of it because of his earthly yearnings, because of his earthly needs, because he was hungry, because his flesh dominated him. He gave up something that important. There was no returning. I'm trying to hurry up. He didn't really value his birthright. And so just a little affliction like hunger was all that it took. That was the price. A little affliction. And we could risk viewing our salvation the same way. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, if we look at verses 18 through 24, and boy, I wish I could, but I know in the interest of time, I can't. What the writer begins to say after he said just how valuable this thing is, and, and, you, and you just shouldn't take it lightly. Don't make the mistake of Esau. He starts to tell them as a New Testament church, we just talked about all the patriarchs. We just talk about the hall of faith. You have it so much better. How dare you? You have, oh, I wish I could go through it. But basically, I could just say, you get to go, you get to go to Zion. You get to go to God directly. Not even Moses, all of them, they had to deal with God in the physical realm. They had to deal with him in a in a, a, a hill that could be burned. Yeah, that's right. You get to go behind the curtain. You get to have God for real. You get to approach the judge of all. You get to go to Jesus himself. The glorified Jesus. Oh, you get to have something better than what Abel had. Oh, what a valuable thing you're taking for granted. So he gets to 25 and he says, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, talking about Moses or the prophets, much more shall we not escape if we turn away, what, from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then just shook the earth. But now he hath promised saying, yet once more will I shake not just the earth, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. The bottom line is only the stuff that cannot be shaken will remain. In the end, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Okay, the kingdom is what cannot be moved. Let's just get that straight. Let us have grace, meaning gratitude, whereby we may do what? Which points to the fact that you can serve God unacceptably. You say you're serving God, but it's not 
an acceptable way to serve God. We should be serving God with reverence and godly fear, but we have cheapened God to be somebody that owes us something. We have cheapened Jesus to be somebody that's just supposed to run around and solve all of our, he solved the most important problem. We should be entering his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and we should come to him with reverence. Where is the reverence? Where is the godly fear? Jesus is not your homeboy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish in a bit. I just ask that you in these last waning moments go to Revelation with me so we can finish driving this point home. The subject, the topic, you could say the title is, is, is please value salvation. That's what I'm mainly asking you to do. If you've not gotten saved, if you're not saved, I want you to covet it and want it. But if you already have it, don't take it lightly. If you already have a relationship with God, don't take him lightly. People who are in a relationship and they start thinking the person ain't never going to leave them, that's how you find out what they're really made of. That's right. That's right. When you know you go get away with something and nobody's going to prosecute you, that's how we find out what you're really made of. Please value the relationship. Please value what he did for you. Please value the opportunity that we have. But let's go to Revelation chapter 3 because I'm going to finish there to make the point really clear. Revelation chapter 3 and we're going to quickly read these few verses about uh, uh, the church of Sardis. We know that there were seven churches. We knew there were seven letters. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write this. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. He said that about every church, so it's not unique about Sardis, okay? I know your works. That thou hast a name, you have a reputation, people think, the church world thinks that you are alive. The reputation, the word on the street is you guys got it going on over there. You got your programs, it's packed out all the time, your music is the best. You have a name that you livest, and yet you're dead. <laughs> Nothing wrong with some good praise music. Nothing wrong with programs. Nothing wrong with preaching an encouraging message. As long as you provide the whole gospel, amen? amen. The fourfold gospel, hallelujah. He says, verse 2, be care, be watchful. Does that sound familiar? Be watchful and strengthen, meaning secure, to fix firmly, to direct your attention to the things which remain. Sardis, that are ready to die. Your reputation is that you got it going on. I'm telling you, you're dead. Why am I saying you're dead? Not because every single thing that's there is dead, but the majority is dead, even though the world says you got it going on. Even though they want to talk to you on TV, even though they want to give you more time on air. The world says you're great, but God said you're dead. And you got some stuff that's ready to die. And I'm telling you to be watchful. I'm telling you to be vigilant. I'm telling you to strengthen. I'm telling you to secure. I'm telling you to firmly fix the little bit that remains that are ready to die. For I have not found your works to be perfect before God, meaning complete. You're not doing everything I told you to do. You're not doing it the way I told you to do it. Verse three, remember therefore, remember therefore how you have received and heard and hold what? Hold fast. Don't take it lightly. And what? Repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch. This is God talking. Is it? It's read in my Bible. This is Jesus talking. If, in case you're wondering, that, that God is, yes, he's love. If, therefore, you do not watch. If you're not on your toes because somebody told you it's all grace all the time and you ain't got to worry about what you do, how you do it, who you do it with, how you relate to God. 
He says, I will come on thee as a thief. And you will not know the hour that I come upon thee. In other words, if I find you still slipping, if I find you still propagating that false doctrine, if I find you still tolerating that mess, if I find you still letting your church continue to die, I will come upon you swiftly. You will not see me coming and I don't have good intentions. Now I'm, I'm about to wrap up. But are you, re are you reading your Bible with me? Yes. Thou hast a few names. That means a few people. I told you before, the majority, that's why you consider considered dead. Not because everybody's dead spiritually, but because the majority is dead spiritually. But they thought they had it going on. That's right. You have a few names. You have a few people. Notice this is beautiful. God didn't give up. He, he could see the few people. He can see the remnant. You're not in the majority. He can see when you're trying to do the right thing, when it seems like everybody else is, is, is getting accolades for doing the wrong thing and you're doing the right thing. You're in a minority. That's painful, but God sees. You have a few people, even in Sardis, which have not what? Defiled their garments. Does that sound familiar? That have not defiled their garments. That have not g given themselves completely over to the lasciviousness. And this whole thing about it don't really matter. It don't take all that. That have not defiled their garments. Now this is Jesus talking. And they which walk with me in white, or they shall walk with me in white. Who, who shall walk with him in white? Those that have not defiled their garments, those that have not turned their back on God, those that have not cheapened their salvation, those that have not said I could do anything anytime with anybody that I want because I'm just saved because I said something 10 years ago. I may have meant it then, but I don't mean I mean it now. He says, for they are worthy. Now we know it's not because of their, they can't make themselves be saved. They can't be good enough to be saved. But you know what? I came to save you and you didn't spit in my face. So I don't mind taking you with me forever. But if I come to save you and you spit in my face, or if I come to save you and you let me save you, but then you talk about me and you don't value me for the rest. What? Really? I want to spit. Really? Spit the rest of Oh, no, I don't think so. This is Jesus talking. He says, those folks are worthy. And he says, he that overcometh, that is the word Nike or Nike. We talk about it with the shoes. He that is victorious. He that finishes the race. He that gets the crown because he finished the race that God set before you. Amen. He that overcometh. This is who I'm talking about. He that overcometh. You want to know who's going to be there? He that overcometh. You know who's going to be with God? He that overcometh. You know who's really saved? He that overcometh. Amen. He that overcometh. The same shall be clothed in white raiment. Hallelujah. And I will not, look at this, you didn't see this the first time you saw it. I will not blot, what? Is it possible? What? Wait a minute now, what did he say? He that overcometh, that's the one, he shall be clothed in white, walking with me in glory. And these I will not blot out. What? There's blotting? That's possible? It's in red? There's blotting? And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Blotting means like redacting legally. You take that big old marker thing and when you see the copies of it, it's all black. You can't see what's behind there, okay? It also means erasing. Jesus chose to say that those who are really rock and rolling with me, those who finish the race and don't get re uh, resentful and don't find excuses and don't rationalize the, a faulty doctrine or a faulty life, he shall be clothed in white walking with me. And I, he, it is he, it is he, it is she, it is they that I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And you know if your name is not in the book of life, where you're going? You're going where the false prophet, and you're going with Satan, and you're going where the Antichrist, and everybody that followed them is a bit lake of fire. He says, but rather I will confess that person's name before my father and before the angels. He that hath an ear, spiritual ear, let him hear. Ooh. 
please value what you have in God. Please value salvation because our God, the God of our salvation, deserves it. And for your own good. So today, my people of God, today is the day for you not to forsake so great a salvation. Today is the day for you to make your paths straight if they're not straight. That doesn't mean just straighten up and fly right. It means actually doing yourself a favor and making it easier on yourself so you don't fall. Today is the day for you to lay aside every sin and every weight. Go on to consecration, but then don't pick that thing up when you finish. Don't go on to consecration just to say, this is what gets in my way from spending more quality time with God. So I'm going to let that thing go for a week. But then if you pick it up on, on the next day, what good does that do? Go on to consecration and commit to letting that thing go forever and ask God's help in doing so. Every sin and every weight. Today is the day to recognize your father's love when he's correcting you. That is out of love. He doesn't hate you. And so it shouldn't trigger resentment. A real father, a loving father, tells you where you're going wrong. And Satan sullied that from the beginning. He gave us that mindset that allows us to look at God the wrong way because we didn't get what we wanted or he didn't give us what we wanted when we wanted it, how we wanted it. And so if we recognize God's love, then we show his value to us through our lives, through our actions. So now is the time to strengthen that that remains. We are the remnant church. We are those who will be right or die for Jesus. No matter what comes in the end times, we need to be strengthened. Amen? We just, God says we deserve to be strengthened, acknowledged, and strengthened, and, and, and equipped. Those who value God have heaven to look forward to. Is that a good thing? Amen. Give God a hand praise for that. God says, in the day you hear my voice, harden not your hearts. I'm not your enemy. Harden not your hearts. So do we hear him today? Amen. Maybe for somebody it's the first time. I believe everybody here has already given their lives to the Lord. But maybe, I don't know how many are out there. But it's possible that somebody out there says, oh, my God, you know, this is real. And if that's you, I suggest that, yes, you start with the sinner's prayer saying, you know what? I, I realize, oh, my goodness, God is really good. My circumstances were not a representation of my God. Even jacked up Christians were not a reputation of God. And now I realize he's really a loving God. He's really loves me. And he has a he, he, he has heaven waiting for me if I'm willing to take it. And Jesus sacrificed for me. He loved me that much. I accept that I was wrong. I accept I drank the Kool-Aid that Satan gave Eve in the garden, and now I'm throwing it away and everything that went with it. If that's you today, then happy birthday that you accept the bloodshed of Jesus Christ and you can be a new man, a new woman. That's the beginning. It ain't the end. He's got a race for you to run. And so I just encourage you, whether you're a newbie as of this day, or whether you're a veteran or whether you're somewhere in between, run your race. Don't let life circumstances trip you up. Don't let anybody have you take God lightly, take your salvation lightly, and not come to God the way we're supposed to come to God. Please value salvation. Value salvation. Please, it will show in how you manage your life. It will tell you and God whether he's really your God or whether you think it's the other way around. Please value what we've been given. I've said enough. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just give God some praise. Let's give him some glory. He is so worthy. He is so worthy. He is so worthy. Thank you, God, for loving us enough. Thank you, God, for telling us the truth. Thank you, God, for not letting us go over the cliff without any breaks. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. 
Hallelujah for looking beyond our faults and seeing our needs and making it possible to be with you forever. Thank you, God. Thank you, God.